Okay. All those in favor of the minutes of revised minutes of October 21st? Aye. Aye. Three to zero, please. Okay. We have some discussion around the public safety complex and library under the Green Communities grants. And that is the grant round. We have our 182,000 and change. And there have been uh, requests by some department heads in the case of the libraries trustees about adding dimming to one area that would be paid for by the trustees through a fund they have but also at the public safety complex there was a change request being sent in uh, I'm sorry being explored uh, to expand the original audit work we sent a correspondence to the contractor um, and the department head saying listen this is a grant round and those monies are based on an assessment. Mm. If you're going beyond the assessment, there's no, there's no available appropriation at this point. Right. And that correspondence has been sent and we wanted to document this in a couple of ways. One, the f for me, Tom, you're talking about state agencies and agencies prior. Here we have a, a grant round for, again, you know, $180,000 worth. 183,000, nearly 183,000 dollars worth, and then there's a series of requests that have come in that are fundamentally different than the design that was submitted. So, a position that was taken again was to not granted. If you want to, if you want to actually go for it and redesign it, come back as a standalone project. And I wanted to bring that up in a public session, as opposed to through Cindy or through a correspondence with the department head. Mm. It's not that the goals are not laudable, they may well be, but they're well beyond what was applied for in the grant. Right. And I wanted to have that uh, public discussion uh, with the board. Yep, that makes perfect sense. Comments? Um, I, I would think all our department heads are pretty aware of how how things work and where money comes from. So if there's not an appropriation, I don't know how they can, uh, how you can even entertain this. Right. Right. If it's five dollars and you have it in your budget, or ten dollars, or or a hundred dollars, and mm -hmm. and they want a widget when they had put in for a, a gadget, and you you get a widget for a hundred dollars, right. it makes sense. But thousands of dollars and changes. Tens, tens of thousands. Right. Tens of thousands. Right. It, it's in that's in 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 the business they call that scope creep. Yep. Exactly. And, oh yes, a whole lot of that. Yep. And 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 sometimes and and we had good money paid to do the audit to begin with. Mm -hmm. We had uh, quality people that are companies that did that. Um, and and I guess what I would say is that if we had if we had that additional money. Or if it's so, let it stand on its own. Bring it forward next time. Absolutely. Bring it, bring it forward at the Springtown meeting and make a case for it, right. and see if the, the town fund it through, through uh, our capital needs. Mm -hmm. But to do it now because someone says you should do it doesn't make sense to me. Right. Pretty simple. And that, that captures that captures the the sentiment. That captures the conversation with uh, both department head as well as contractor saying where does that come from uh, given the overall size of it i'd say it's more than just creep right good point yeah okay next up and thank you for that uh george howie superintendent has uh we'll skip down one highway labor uh labor appointment recommendations so cindy and george have been working on interviews and we have a recommendation for Barrett Rogaleski. I wonder if that's George's kid. Huh. My father went to school with some Rogaleskis. Hmm. We have this recommendation from the highway superintendent. I'd like to recommend Barrett Rogaleski Jr for open full-time highway laborer truck driving position and the rate is $22 an hour. He has all of the, he's got class B, he's got hoisting, as well as the experience. As a young man, that's a lot of experience. He doesn't have a board, he doesn't want to go get it. Yep. 
That was part of the part of the requirements. Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Okay. Yeah. Questions to the board? If not, no. Uh, make a motion to accept as second. recommended. Motions made and seconded to uh, appoint, <coughs> excuse me, Barrett Rogaleski Jr. as a full-time highway laborer truck driver. All those in favor? Aye. All right, three to zero, please. Okay. So many paper clips. Yeah. I'm going to get them all back. It's a full recycle. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, we have, I'm not passing over entirely, Cindy. Uh, Maya has sent a two year, uh, so Maya is our interlocutor, interagency uh, insurer. And they have sent a notice to us that their uh, proposal for a two-year freeze on our two-year freeze on our uh, premiums, and this is for property general liability workers comp, uh, and this is not health. It's important to bear that in mind. And this is for current as well as plus one, so two years of freeze on our rates, which not bad. We haven't added a lot of buildings. We haven't changed a lot of our asset. It's Workers true. comp, you know, we have, we have stability there. Yep. Uh, we don't have as much turnover as some private industry does. We certainly don't have uh, the kinds of staff that would, anyway, our sick codes are different than linesmen and forest yep. workers and machinists, et cetera. So uh, all that, leads to a two-year freeze, which helps in budgeting. We were also oh, yeah. coming into this fiscal year. It's the second yep. year of a two-year guarantee for them. So, so it's two-year, two-year, two-year. Excellent. So is there a uh, motion to accept? Uh, motion. This is required by signature. Second. Right. Motion's made and seconded to accept two-year freeze on those aspects of our insurance premiums. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three to zero, please. Okay. Next up, uh, as we have <clears throat> no, we have four minutes, we'll be on time. Um, as we have no town administrator, uh, Cindy's been picking up uh, more than bits and pieces. Last time we were in transition between town administrators five years ago, uh, there was a step in compensation during the interim period, and that was a value, a flat value per pay period. So ex expanded responsibilities, added hours, added inputs, although I think the chair is signing much more than they used to, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I have to, right? Um, or the, any chair would. Um, and and uh, Cindy's, Cindy's uh, made, Cindy and I have spoken and uh, it's looking for a dollar value of around $500 per pay period until we fill the position. I think the last time we were a little south of that, but you know it's busy right now. So I wanted to put that on the table for discussion. And it ends when we get somebody in here. Okay. Dave, from a personnel committee's perspective, I know it's not it's not anything that you guys contemplate, but we we've lived through this before on, on two occasions now. Yeah. But yep. two occasions two occasions in ten years. Nearly ten years, and more than ten years. Yeah, so it's not it's not so bad, you know. So are you looking it's, at additional hours? I've been putting in a lot of hours. <laughs> so, our, I guess the question is: Are we are we putting in additional hours, and is this a is it a rated hourly rate, or for X amount of hours, or or how? And, and again, I, I just want to be fair. So, yep. so if you're if you're if you're saying that you're going to have ten hours a week mm -hmm. at twenty five dollars a week or not an hour, that's fine. Yeah. Um, if you, if it's and again for for it's just a comp. If someone says, well, you're giving her X amount of dollars for right how, how, how for what right, right. and and, yeah. and, and you fair. have to be able to you have to be able to to tell people, okay, it's ten hours or it's fifteen hours or it's five hours a week. You know what right. I mean? How do you quantify it? Yeah. And again, it's just trust me. Mm -hmm. if, if if you don't if you don't if sure. you don't if you don't define yep. what it is, it allows yourself to be questioned. And, and I don't, I'm not questioning. I'm just saying 
if there's there's an expectation. Yeah, yeah. Cindy, why don't you and I talk tomorrow about actually how many extra hours are we putting in already in the last couple of weeks? Right, we've been at this for yeah. a month now. Yeah, I, I, and again, I don't have a problem. I just the question is how do we define it? Right, right. You just, yeah. you, I, and again, I, I think you should, we should do it. I just, I just want to define what the expectation is. Yeah, yeah. I've never gotten compensation when we've had um, town administrators leave, yeah. mm -hmm. even though I've picked up the slack. This is a lot more now. Yeah. Sherry was very busy. Oh, and, and, again, and stuff like yeah. that, and all the things I'm doing, and the board of health work I'm doing, and everything else. So every year we're doing more, more. we're doing more and more work every <laughs> year. Right. I got and compensated again, when I did the um, treasure collector or the collector's position. I got yeah. compensated for that when I picked up. So that what? Extra responsibility for outside months. of our meetings, mm -hmm. you know, and it being obviously busier by volume. Yep. How many hours do you think you are putting in at additional? At Probably five or six at least right now, yep. if not more. Yep. Plus, I'm taking on more during the day, so right. I'm bringing more stuff home. Correct. Yeah. Um, I was here until quarter five last Thursday. Yeah. I normally get off at two. Yeah. <laughs> doing emails all weekend, all that sort of thing, and doing minutes at home. I'm yeah. doing a lot of that stuff at home. Yeah. Because it's kind of hard to get it done here. So. So depending on depending on the given week and the and the volume, it sounds like you're picking up a minimum a minimum of ten and maybe north of that. Right. And I already was That's carrying right. a, and again, a comp time just, balance. Yep, it's something you know, it's, yeah. and and you just have to be able to justify it, right? Yeah. And then you, from get, a, you, you got to do the straight face test. Absolutely right. Yeah. Well, the nice thing is too, from then from a personnel committee perspective, then we've got some precedent there. So if we need to Good do it for too. somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, and another issue comes up or it happens again, then mm -hmm. we've got we've got you know some history and a pattern there and something to look out, you know. So. I just think that, and you know, maybe there's one thing you can do in a company, your own company, but sure. when you deal with taxpayer dollars, sure. you just oh, yeah. have to be consistent. Yeah. That's why we're having this discussion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Um, so, uh, not to exceed 15 hours. Yep. Yeah. That's fine. Right. So, yep. not not to exceed 15 hours, and then I can tip over into other stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does that sound right for you, Cindy? Sure. Okay. A pay period. Is it or 15 hours? Uh, for the pay period. I mean, that's what we're bench. That's what we're benchmarking. So the yeah, stipend yeah. on. Essentially, yeah. it's a stipend, right? It's a stipend it is, for additional right. duties right. and additional hours. Right. Okay. And I just and I think it's important that we and again, people have to realize that there's nothing for nothing. Right. It's a fair point. Yep. You know. Yep. And that and and that and that. Look, I mean, come and say, well, you don't need any help. Look, your your administrative assistant is doing all that work. What right. do you need a town administrator for? Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, they, and I just, I just want to sign. There has to be a value. People have mm -hmm. to understand there's a value to the work that that city's doing. Fair point. That's fine. Uh, values, it's 500 per pay period. Still all right. I mean, that's that's a request. Is this part we haggle down? <laughs> It's. I thought it was two fifty. I think that was the last time. So no, I got three hundred a pay period when I was doing the collector job. As a stipend, and mm -hmm. I did that also for payroll. Mm -hmm. When I did payroll, which was above and beyond my other duties, I was getting three hundred dollars a pay period to do the payroll. And a bushel of wheat. <laughs> I never saw the wheat. <laughs> no. Is there? Is is it a similar time, Cindy? No. No. It's more time in this I case. I think it's more time for Way this. Way more time. Yeah. Thoughts? We have appropriation in the town administrator's salary line because okay. of the existing appropriation and the opening. Okay. I think that's awesome. There's a balance what, what of forty-eight thousand dollars in there right now. I'm looking to I'm looking to expand the hours that Cindy's being compensated for. Uh, during the period with have no town administrator. Okay. So then, so that's one. That's yep. how gonna much? I'm uh, going to change that to up to 15 additional hours. Okay. Per, per pay, pay period, period. period. Per pay period. Okay. And then now we have to assign a value. So treasurer collector work was 300 last time. And uh, in the discussion that Cindy and I had, the first pass was asking for 500 per pay period, which is 250 a week, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a uh, motion for those parameters. Second. 
A second for discussion. What what do you what do you what's your hourly rate going to be? I, that's something I, I'm not quite sure of. What the hourly rate would actually be with the stipend? So seven and a half hours and two hundred and fifty dollars would be. I have a calculator. <laughs> Everybody's got their phones out. <laughs> What's the base rate, Cindy? 35, 35. My base rate's 22. Yeah. Where did I put my calculator? So if it's 35. Yeah. Yeah. Call it 35. Huh? 35. It's around 35. Yeah. Right. It's about 35. It's a good math. Round it off. Thirty-three point three 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 three. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's math. Right. You know, it's math. Right. So the. All right. So, all right. Yeah. Should be comfortable with those numbers. I'm comfortable with that. This has the stipend, the volume of work that's been going on. Okay. All right. So it's essentially an eleven for the periods, the base responsibilities plus eleven dollars an hour. If you look at the salary of the town administrator, it's certainly below that. So. And, and again, I, pass the face test. David, when David goes to the personnel committee and, or someone sees you on the kind side of the street, you yeah, have to right. you right. have to be able to. Got to be able to explain it all. Correct. Yep. Got it. Well, I currently work thirty hours mm -hmm. a pay period. I mean a week. Yeah. So, so yeah, motion made and seconded. And this again for the stipend, it will be an hourly rate of basically thirty three thirty three. Okay. Additional 15 hours per period. Yep. Okay, there's a motion. Re retroactive to when Sherry left? Or if I'm moving forward? You drive a hard bargain. <laughs> Let's set the rate in the hours first. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Your motion's made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, three to zero, please. Okay, retroactive. That's going to be how many pay periods? It's one and At a half. At least one and a half. And the one we're in now. We confirm with the accountant that money's there to do that? I have the sheets right here. Yep. And it's forty-eight and $48,011 is the balance in the budget. Discussion about taking the backwards glance? Yeah, I think that's fine. It's a short period, and as long as we verified the funding, mm -hmm. we're we totally all right. So one and a half pay periods. Do you want to see this? No. If the accountant's got it wrong and, you, and, and you're forging it, you're the ones going to jail. It's not me. It. <laughs> I can't change That's this report. Right. <laughs> OK. Any other discussion with respect to? No, I'm good. Is there a motion? Uh, motion. Motion's made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's made and second. Any more discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three to zero, please. Okay. Thank you. We're seven minutes behind schedule for an interview. Sorry. Sorry. You just got to watch us work. How'd we do? Very good. All right. Come on up. Tonight we're talking with uh, Kevin, is it Filchick? Yes, perfect. All right. Uh, I'm Scott. This is Tom and David. Thanks for coming in tonight. Hi, Kevin. Nice to meet you, sir. So we have, um, as you know, the town uh, has an opening for a town administrator, an interim town administrator. Our goal is to hire a full-time administrator. Um, unless it goes south, we end up with an interim, and that, that's, that's a step that we're prepared to take. Uh, we have... Uh, close the application uh, acceptance. We have conducted two interviews. We have uh, you tonight, two more tomorrow. Um, the applications are sent to the personnel committee, of which David's a, a board representative, and uh, screened for qualifications. And those names were sent to the board. And so uh, we're not using a screening committee only in that we're looking to expedite I hate to use the word expedite. We need to be just as thorough as we can <coughs> because it's in the best interest of the town to find the best candidate for this position. It's an important position. That said, uh, we are um, 
we're, we're kind of old sages up here. We, we've been at it a little while, and we, we were advised by town council at one point that you guys pretty much know how to stay out of trouble, and you know, you're know you gonna have to make a decision anyway. We're having a public hearing. This is a public interview, not hearing, public interview. It's on TV, she's on it. And uh, it will be broadcast to millions and millions and millions of people in the four surrounding, three surrounding communities in ours. Wonderful. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, live forever on YouTube like every other bad video. Um, so that, that said, uh, we have some questions. I think we have about, I'm not exaggerating this time, 144, but we choose 15, and uh, then give you a chance to talk a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, ask us questions. So, that, any questions to start? Four to get started. All right, uh, lines of questioning. I'm going to do round robin, speed date dial. Sure. All right, let's do it. Kevin, please tell us why you're interested in this position. So uh, I have been working in local government since I got out of college. Um, and although my career has been fairly brief, I've only worked in local government, and it's given me a nice perspective on the value that local government can bring to communities. So I started in a community similar to Sunderland, a small rural Connecticut community that really didn't had more buffaloes than people at times. Um, so I kind of got to experience that, that, that nice uh, community that you can get from that small community feel. But I benefited because I lived near the University of Connecticut, so similar to you guys, you're near uh, Amherst. So I got to see both sides of the very rural and also the impact that a fairly large uh, educational institution can bring to a region. So when I saw Sunderland had an open position, I thought it was a very nice fit. And for me, in my career goals, I've been working, you know, started serving on boards and committees as a volunteer, you know, worked my way through my graduate degree in public administration, now serve as a department head in Sturbridge. This seems to be the next logical step for me, and again, it's a perfect, uh, reminds me of Connecticut, so. Uh, um, okay, uh, what, uh, what, what, are your, what were the two most difficult problems you've encountered in your previous positions and how did you solve them? So <clears throat> it's interesting, uh, the topic you had previous, because mm -hmm. uh, in Sturbridge what I do is I serve as the economic development coordinator for the town. So uh, prior to my tenure, there was no one in my position. My position didn't exist. I was on the first to hold the position. Hmm. So I came in and one of the first things I heard was that Sturbridge is a difficult place for businesses to operate. And one of my first goals was to change that narrative and to work to make sure that we're making connections with the business community, that we're hearing them, that we're you know, serving whatever needs they have um, so that they aren't having a, a challenging time coming to Sturbridge or operating here. And I've been working on that for three years. So it's a, it's a, we've made strides, but we still have a long way to go. So it's not a, a problem that is easily solvable. It's one that we're continuously working to solve. And I think we've been moving nicely in that direction, but it's still, it'll take a long time after I'm there to, to continue that. And I think as you saw here, it's, it's a narrative that's not unique to any one community. Um, and when you're dealing with a state, it adds other layers that you have to try to contend with. Um, so that's probably been my, one of my bigger challenges uh, that I've had to face. Um, another problem, and I'll, that was kind of my, mac, my nice macro example, go a little bit smaller for the next one. Uh, again, being a brand new department, there's no precedent. There's no anything for me to kind of a good feeling sometimes though, right? It, you, you can, can, it can be, <laughs> right. it can be very good. It can also be a bit of a challenge. Right. Um, and that's kind of where uh, we ran into some problems early on. Uh, my job had been done previously by other department heads. They kind of had divvied it up and people did different aspects of it. So early on I uh, was talking to a business owner, gave them advice I thought was correct, it turned out later to be <laughs> incorrect. Uh, and I got called on it by one of the department heads and we had, uh, a bit of a, a, a disagreement on how best to handle it. And we kind of realized after we sat down and talked about it, okay, we, we really hadn't been communicating effectively at all. So 
uh, that was a problem that, you know, it was small and it was a simple solution and just to, you know, start communicating better with each other, but it gave me a very powerful lesson and that's why it sticks out for me. So those are two of my more memorable problems, I'd say, in my last uh, position. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm going I'm to drill down on that and, and ask straight away, uh, biggest work-related failures. What did you learn? Why did they occur? Not, sure. necessarily, not necessarily in that order, but yeah. Yeah, no, so I, I really I, crashed, you know, and, and no, what did you learn and, you know, how'd you go about it? Go ahead. Sure, no, and I, I would say those are, are some good examples, but, uh, you know, we try and we fail sometimes. Absolutely. And in government, um, it, it happens. And for me, uh, you know, working with, with, you know, business, I have 510 business for business owners in town, so I have to try to do what I can to please as many of them as I can not always going to be able to accomplish that. Uh, we've tried different initiatives and different programs. Okay. Um, in town, for instance, we tried a, uh, a, uh, a shuttle service in town. Hmm. It was a really good idea to solve a problem that we have. We don't have public transport mm -hmm. in town. We have a very large transient population because of, we have 14 hotels in town, over a thousand hotel rooms, so we get a lot of people coming in. Sure. But again, if you're coming to the area, you don't know where you're going. So we have to try to figure out a way to transport you around. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I worked with business owners to actually bring a shuttle service to Sturbridge. We, it was a public-private partnership to mm -hmm. make it happen. We ran a pilot. Great program, got a lot of great um, feedback from business owners and from those who took it. Then the eternal question comes up after the pilot program ends, because we funded it through a grant, well now how do we fund it? We haven't been able to fund it since. It's a shame that we weren't able to do it, but it was uh, a good proof of concept for us that maybe later on we can find a, a source of funding that would make it work. So for me, that was probably one of my, uh, you know, that was one of my harder fails, just because it was something that we knew works, yeah. but it just it's just not practical. Hmm. Um, so that was probably one that sticks out more in my mind. Lessons, lessons learned from that. Um, Always the funding is, is the eternal question. But I, I think what was great about it was that we were able to work with some very, very passionate local business owners mm -hmm. who were able to say, okay, we see this problem. Here's how we can fix it. You from the government side can bring, in, can bring a certain level of expertise and a certain perspective that can help us organize it. We were able to get them the funding that they needed. They were able to pull together the resources, plan the route, mm -hmm. um, using some uh, plans that we had previously developed. So it was a good lesson on how the public and the private sectors can work very closely together to create a, a good solution. Cool. Thanks so much, Kevin. Of course. Kevin, actually this is, this is really kind of like the third question in the series here. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you're, on, you're on a roll, not, right? Not yeah. we thought through these questions. But, um, what strategies do you use to anticipate problems mm -hmm. Give examples, and if a problem rises that you have not anticipated, how are you likely to handle it? And also give an example. Sure. So, for for me, I've been when I started local government, I started in emergency management. So I started dealing with emergencies where you have to deal with problems pretty much right away. Um, so for me, I, I kind of ascribe to what FEMA, you know, uh, lays out as, a, as their problem solving. So you have to take steps to mitigate the risk or problem before it happens. So, you know, an emergency management is fairly simple. If you're dealing with a hurricane, you, you know, get all, you know, gas up all your vehicles, make sure you have power, pre-plan and pre-stage. For something like a town administrator, do you have up-to-date policies? Are you educating your staff in those policies? If we're talking about finance and, and accounting, do we, are we following best practices? Um, and if we're doing all of that, that reduces the likelihood that a problem's going to arise. Uh, when a problem does occur, when it inevitably will, for me it's it's really a matter of finding not just the symptom of the problem, but what's the root cause. And again, it, we'll go back to the uh, you know policy question. If we have a uh, a staff person who is has violated the policy, well, did we educate them in the policy? Did we actually train them properly in that policy? If not, why didn't we do that? If we did, okay, well then that kind of takes us in a different route. 
Um, but again, we have to find the root cause of what the problem is, not just the symptoms. And then we have to, after the problem's you know, been solved, try to find ways to make sure it doesn't happen again. It goes back to that mitigation cycle. Um, and just make sure that, again, we're, we're taking those steps. So for me, you know, I problem solve <laughs> fairly consistently mm -hmm. um, with what we have to do. We, uh, we did a drill for sheltering and we very quickly realized that we didn't have adequate radios to communicate effectively amongst ourselves. So we, for the time, just said, okay, we're gonna designate runners, you're just gonna go and that's how we pass information. Later on, when we could step back, we said, okay, we need to find funding to you know, purchase new radios. So that's what we did. We went through state, got a grant, and purchase radios that now work fine, and we've solved that problem. Um, so again, it's, it's what do you do beforehand to reduce the likelihood of a problem? How do you address the root cause of the problem when it's happening? And how do you address it afterwards to make sure it never happens again? What kind of radios you get? Just simple walkies. Um, we didn't want to have to, we, to go through the, it, this, we got these through the CCP grant, uh, Citizen Corp program. <laughs> grant and uh, we didn't want to have to go through the P25 compliance. Um, it was just simpler to get a walkie um, because we do have police portables that our CERT team uses, um, but we felt it just was simpler just to get the simple walkies and that worked out fine. Battery powered or? Uh... Yes. Rechargeable battery powered. It was, a, it was a simple, inexpensive solution to a complex problem. I think we got 25. That's good. And a lot of batteries. Yeah. A lot of batteries. Mm. Thank you, Kevin. Of course. Um, I guess this one will kind of round up the whole <laughs> negative problem. Yeah, so get right in there. Yeah, I may as well just wrap them all up. So you lost a leg. Yeah. No. <laughs> so, well. Well, exactly. No. Reminds me of a tail. <laughs> this one's, can you give an example of maybe something a little different? Now, sure. Of um, a creative problem solving that you have. So you uh, think of something that um, you ended up solving the problem, not by some of the more obvious methods, but something a little unusual, maybe. And it can be an unusual problem, too. <laughs> squirrels stuck in the town offices, you know, whatever it happens to be. Well, well um, we don't have squirrels down there so much, which is good, um, but uh, we do have mice. But uh, I, I, would, I would go back to my example with, with, the, with our partnership with uh, the local businesses to, to kind of create that transportation route. For us, that would, again, um, that is a, a, a major problem in Sturbridge for us is the lack of, of transportation. So finding that alternative was a huge help to us. Um, and it was a solution that we previously hadn't been able to, we hadn't thought of because uh, what we had done prior to my tenure, we had gotten a CCP grant, or sorry, a, no, a CCC grant, a, a Commonwealth Community Compact grant to do a trolley study. Mm -hmm. We realized while we were doing this, study, and I came in midway through that study to be, to be transparent, but we realized it just, we have just a very difficult roadway. So, um, you know, a trolley, which is gonna need protected left-hand turns, which is going to require uh, potentially, uh, you know, a, a route that's not gonna be longer than 60 minutes. For us, it would have been about 60 minutes. Um, it, it just wasn't practical. So when we found that partnership and just said, we'll just do a 12-person shuttle bus, that was, are really kind of unique way to, to address that problem. So that would be one example, but since I already said that, let me give you a, mm. another one. Um, uh, when uh, you know, I came in again, we, we weren't really communicating with the businesses. We were communicating with them in select meetings. We were talking to them when they would come in for permits. We would uh, you know, talk to them in, in, a, in a more obvious way. So for us, or when I came in, I said, we need to be doing more direct action with these businesses. We need to make sure that we're making that, uh, we're, we're just having that face-to-face -face with them. So I started a couple different programs in town. We started a business class program mm -hmm. where in essence we would bring together department heads, maybe Board of Health, maybe uh, uh, Town Planner to discuss signage, and Sturbridge signage is another fairly large issue. Mm -hmm. 
but just to explain why we do what we do. So a lot of people complain about signs. We brought our town planner and say, here's what we here's what we do and why we do it. To explain, you know, we're, we have these rules in place to prevent sign clutter in town, and this is why we say it has to be lit in this way and why it has to be done in this way. We brought in the board of health agent to do something similar. Say, this is why I ask you for. Um, these reports. This is why I check your refrigerator. And again, it's just a way to bridge those gaps that had been created previously. And again, it's taking time, but you know, by doing those, by doing uh, another program we started was a, a business breakfast program where I in essence buy business owners breakfast. They come, they get to eat, and we tell them about whatever it is we're working on. We've done those on marijuana. We've done those on uh, just again science. Mm -hmm. uh, it's run the game. Conservation was another big one. To try to just, again, help build those connections and answer questions that they have. And to really stand in front of them and say, we're here, ask your questions that you have, whatever they may be. So uh, again, the, the narrative of storage being difficult for business was there. And I was saying, let's try to show that we're, we're, being, we're forward leaning and saying, you know, we're here to help you, not here to uh, prevent you from succeeding. Yeah, the shuttle, did that just go on to various stops in the town? Yes. So the, um, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with Sturbridge, but, uh, you know, we have, a, we have two main streets that are connected, and they're both state-owned roads, so we don't, so that creates a whole other challenge for us. Mm -hmm. um, but the road is high traffic, um, high traffic, or high speeds, and there's not a lot of lights to make protected left-hand turns. So for a shuttle, it really... Uh, for a shuttle, it's easier, but for a, for a trolley, like you would think of in a in like a Hyannis or a, a Wells Main kind of thing, it just wouldn't be practical. We have a good barbecue restaurant there. Yeah. The best, the second uh, the best in New England, second best in the country. For commercial, yeah, but yeah, we can. We can go down yeah. that road. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> for commercial. Yeah. BTs. Uh, yeah. Huh. BTs. Yeah. But we have 45 fantastic restaurants on top of that. There you so. go. See, that's good economic development right yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. See? See? I like it. And three birds. Sales tax revenue. Uh, yeah, well, we get just shy of a million dollars from the hotels, about half a million from our restaurants alone. Hmm. Hmm. I'm charging $200 to expand. Right, <laughs> right. And there's that. Perfect. So I see, I see obviously, the uh, MPA. Yes. And so this question feels woefully inadequate, but how do you feel your educational background prepared you for this position? Now, you've been like s tears working your way, it seems. That's been the approach, yeah. yeah. I, in college, I think I started wanting to be a Latin teacher, and mm -hmm. that vastly changed when I mm -hmm. realized I didn't want to learn Latin. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but uh, <laughs> I've been working in, in local government for years. And you know, again, you're right. I started off just volunteering on a board, and yep. that was kind of my intro. It encouraged me to get that advanced degree, which I, and I worked, you know, I know we're here in Massachusetts, but UConn did, was, has a great program, so I learned a lot there, and uh, it, it gave me a lot of opportunities to work in, uh, I was actually, I was given the opportunity to work in uh, Mansfield, which has UConn in it, mm -hmm. so I learned a lot there by seeing a larger community, how they operate with the university, um, and how uh, to really lead, I was, Fortunate to Connecticut doesn't have a lot of town administrators. Mm -hmm. They, I think, for ta for a state of 107 or 69 towns and two tribal nations, they have about 40 town administrators in total. Um, I was fortunate to be one of the, one of the town managers who mm -hmm. really is a very uh, good was a very good mentor for me, and I learned a lot from him. So, um, all told, it's just again, you're right. It's just tears and just builds for me. So, nice. and now serving as a department head, being kind of as close to the action as I am, I, I get to see a lot work on a lot for the towns. You to keep your head down just enough, all right? Uh, I, work, I work with business owners. I'm, yeah. I, my head is fully right. up for <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Excellent. Thank Kevin, you. Kevin, what are your three main professional goals for the next five years and 10 years? My next professional goal is really to be in a leadership position where I can affect change. So as a department head, um, I'm a department of one. Um, but in economic development and for emergency management, I oversee a, our CERT team. I'd like to be in a position where I can manage a town through all of its different 
you know, in, a, in every aspect. And for me, that's been my primary goal. My next few goals are really to just continue, continuously learn and, and be better at what I'm doing. Um, I would love to be uh, uh, kind of a, on a smaller goal, uh, have an active role in the MMA. I've had the opportunity to kind of see what they do and I really want to get as, as involved as I possibly can. So if given the opportunity, I would probably be volunteering for as many committees as I can with them to try to make sure that A, Sunderland would be represented, but B, that you know, from a personal standpoint, I would be growing as a leader and learning best practices. And uh, beyond that, just uh, continuing my education. I don't want to stop. Um, I just would like to keep going so that I can one day, uh, my ultimate goal is to be a, is to be a mentor. <laughs> To, to, to the next generation. So I'd like to get to a point where I feel like knowledgeable enough that I can be a mentor. Thank you. Um, so here's a question. So we've got your resume and everything, but tell us a little bit, something about you that we're not gonna find in the resume. Like what, uh, maybe some personal interests, uh, some of the things maybe dovetail into, into uh, work. Too. Never learned Latin. Yeah. <laughs> I took four years, I couldn't tell you any of it. No, um, funnily enough, although I am trying to teach myself Spanish, um, uh, just something I've always wanted to do. No, uh, for me, uh, I am a fairly, you know, I, I, I think anyone who works in this field kind of is a, is a government geek, and I'm proud to admit that. <laughs> so a lot of what I do is, is, is you know, it's kind of revolved around this. I grew up in a family that was government employees, so it kind of, uh, spiral from there. But for me, um, I try to get out. I, I'm, my wife is from Maine, so I'm very much an outdoors kind of guy. I like being in a rural, you know, rural nature. And again, you know, it's kind of what brought me here. Um, but for me, I, I want to say something you wouldn't know. I have three black belts in martial arts. It's kind of what keeps me from, uh, uh, kind of keeps me centered and, and relaxed. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned communicating with businesses and businesses yeah. communicating back in. Uh, how would you how would you go about keeping uh, citizens well informed as a town administrator about governmental matters? Conversely, how would you make sure citizens' views and concerns are actually addressed? So, in this day and age, if you're not on the internet, if you're not on social media, you are not there. Mm -hmm. um, for us, at Sturbridge, we've taken to Twitter. We're trying to get onto Facebook now because that's really where our audience is. Um, so for for me, it's really knowing where is your audience, you know, residing. Are they on Twitter? Are they on Facebook? Are they on none of those? And are they actually in the print media? You need to find where your audience is and connect with them there, and make sure that you're putting out as much information as possible. Uh, enough just to you know, to you know, if you're on Facebook, just enough to say, we're having a board select meeting tonight. Town administrator interview. Go to the website for more information. There, you can kind of go chapter and verse. If you're on social media, keep it nice and brief and simple, but people understand where they can get more information. If you're already, pub, you know, publishing all this on the internet on YouTube, which is fantastic. It's a great way to connect. Uh, just having those social media aspects are a huge component. In Sturridge, what I try to do is just. Phone calls are a huge thing, especially with businesses, just to pick up the phone and you know, talk to BTs and say, how are things going? What can we be doing? That is a nice personal touch that can really, especially with businesses, it can really do wonders to say, we're here, we're listening, what do you need, what can we do? Uh, for residents, you're gonna get residents questions, I get residents questions, you just have to answer the question. If you don't know the answer, Say, I will get you the answer. Don't hang up and say, I don't know. Right. Just say, I will get you the answer as quickly as I can and, and get back to them. Uh, if you're going to, you know, like you did at the beginning of the meeting, make sure that if there are comments are coming to you, that you're presenting those. So you're not just, it's not going into the ether of our emails. It's actually being shown in a meeting. And for us, uh, for what I do, I actually, for any of the committees that I run, I manage three or four different committees in town. Uh, I create packets that are we post online. Mm -hmm. So. If we get communications, it goes into the packet. It's there, it's a public document, you can see it forever. It's again, another, just another way that people can see my question got, was read and it was addressed and you know, if it's shown in the minutes, even better. 
Thank you. Evan, grants and other outside funding are an important part of a town's vision and can greatly enhance opportunities for community growth. Discuss your experience with procuring grants and other outside sources of funding. So in Sturbridge, for emergency management at least, we have a very, very small line item. We have about two grand every year. So I think this past year, off the top of my head, we've gotten grants probably over 15. Because we apply for everything, we know what we need, we know what we want, and we know where we need to go in a few years. So we're applying for the EMPG grant, emergency management performance grant, citizen core grant, uh, hazardous materials grants, and we're getting equipment for our public safety side that we know that they need. And we're you know, maintaining it, we're keeping it up to date. So grants are something that I'm very familiar with. For economic development, we currently have a uh, Commonwealth Community Compact to do a, an economic development self-assessment that we hired that we are using now. Uh, we hired a consultant out of Boston to do that self-assessment, and we got a $25,000 grant for that. So that's another grant that I'm managing right now. Um, so for Sturbridge, we do a lot of grant writing, and we try to procure as many grants as we can. It's something I'm familiar with. We also actually issue grants. So I mentioned earlier we get about a million dollars from hotel tax revenue. We take that and split it up. Two-thirds goes to the general fund, the remaining third is split in half. Half of one of those thirds, which comes out to about $183,000, I oversee as uh, for the committee that I serve, the Service Tourist Association. They actually give out the grants, hmm. give out grants to conferences that want to come to Sturbridge but maybe can't afford certain aspects that maybe, you know, uh, they need help to offset the cost of the hotel. They need help to market their event. They need help to uh, just in general get the messaging out there. We'll actually distribute money to them for free, which give them the grant to do whatever they need to do to promote the town. So not only am I applying for grants and managing those grants as a recipient, I'm also the one who's distributing the funding to uh, the private sector. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, describe your experience in working with citizens from various cultural backgrounds and what approaches have you used to ensure adequate attention is given to those of varying needs of these groups? Because one of the things you'll find here is um, while this is a small rural town, it's actually a, a pretty darn diverse town given the um, proximity to the university and the, sure. the students. We get a lot of, uh, especially a lot of foreign students who um, live here while they're studying. Of course. Um, so it's a pretty Pretty varied small town, and we've got the highest per capita number of apartments in the entire state, so it makes us a little unique here. And that's great. And for me, in again, I'm back to Sturbridge, and I'll also go to Mansfield. Mansfield, I worked in a, in a small town where, you know, on average there are 12,000 people, but with a pot with a student population of 25,000, many of whom are from you know, not the United States. You know, they come in from Asia, they come in from Europe, and they may have English as a second language. We still have to work with them, you know, make sure that we're getting what the information that they need to them so that they can do whatever they needed to do. In Sturbridge, I work with 510 businesses. They run the gamut from people who have grown up in Sturbridge and have never left the town to people, I have several business owners who are from India, who maybe have English as a second language who I work with. Um, it's just something that at this point, we just do naturally because it's just how it is. So it's something that I'm familiar with. It's something that I've quite a lot of experience with. And it's something that uh, I'm very comfortable with. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind, Kevin. Sure. Uh, describe an ethical dilemma you may have faced in the workplace within brackets. And then how, how uh, was the resolution uh, developed? And what was your role in said resolution? Sure. So for me, I've been lucky in that I really haven't come across too many ethical mm -hmm. challenges. M most ethical challenges I think I've gotten is, you, you know, work with business, you might get a gift certificate, in which case you just, for me, it's a simple return it. Yep. Nice thank you note saying thank you, but I can't accept. My rule of thumb is you just don't accept anything. 
Um, and I just am, keep it very polite, but I explain why I'm doing it, you know, state law, and just say it's just how it is. And usually, I don't think I've ever had a business owner who's, or person who said, well, that's a problem. Right. Um, <laughs> they usually are fairly receptive to that. But for me, it's you follow state law, you, there's no question, there's no, there's no gray area, it's you follow the state law. And if you have a question, um, and there have been times when, you know, I know people who've had questions or, you know, work on a committee and, hey, how does this work? Call state ethics board if you're, if you're so, you know, if you're concerned. And they've been, a, you know, I've only had to call them once or twice, but they've been exceedingly helpful. Great. Thank you. Kevin, consider the following situation, which may occur from time to time. Your elected board at a public meeting appears anxious and ready to vote on an important policy decision that you firmly believe would be detrimental to the town. The issue had not been discussed previously and therefore is a new issue. What would you do and how would you do it? So in that instance, I would delicately say that, you know, make my, make my position known to the board. And what I would probably in essence say is, you know, this may be something that we'd want to discuss further and maybe get some more information. You know, I'm not going to, in essence, stand in front of the board and say, this is a terrible decision, you should not do this. I will try to be as, as cautious as I can to say, this is something we need, we, you, would re, you should really consider more thoroughly than we're giving it the time now. And if you take the time to do that, we can give you the research um, and the background to come to a decision. Ultimately, I recognize that it's outside of my hands as you know, a town staff person. You know, I'm not the elected board. The board has the final say. But I will make my opinions known if, if asked. But I will try to make sure that uh, the board is given the best information to make the best possible decision. And again, it would probably would help too is beforehand we would, you know, have enough of a relationship where we, you know, would have hopefully talked about this ahead of time. A little spontaneity, you know. <laughs> so we want to close the road, right? Which is perfectly no. fine. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to cancel Halloween. Yeah. Oh no! Yeah. Not again. Damn it! All right. Thank you. Okay, that's it for our canned questions. Now you get to ask us a few, a few things. Sure. Uh, I guess my first question would be, uh, what would your expectations be for the, uh, for the finalists that you would select? What would your expectations be for the, for the incoming TA? You want to start, David? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're looking for a super candidate who, no. um, I, I think, one of the things, um, is especially about, we were talking about grants and things like that, one of the things that we've been trying to do, and it's been a long process over the years, is to really build up um, procedural strengths and everything. And so that essentially whoever sits here, we have procedures in place and we're not just kind of running things off the cuff because we want to make sure we have st I think stability is a, is a very important thing in terms of how we manage and govern and everything and, and we really want to try to keep that and try to um, obviously you can't control things, but you know but you through procedures and things like that that that's very important to have um, and good working policies and we try to run things as efficiently as we can um, and remove as we kind of like to refer, we sort of refer to it as governing as opposed to like keeping it political. You know, it's because it's you're really trying to run like a service business essentially. I mean, that's sure. what that's what all this is, and we're trying to keep that running as smoothly as possible and trying to be as efficient as we can and look for improvements. So we're trying to build on that. I think, at least from one aspect of it. Tom, what do you think? I I guess. Basically, what I'd look for is someone to um, work closely with our members of our community, um, to be able to work with our members of the community to 
to get their input to un that understands that, that the successful candidate would understand that you you can leadership leadership is a, a a difficult thing. Volunteers are in a town because you 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 need people to share your enthusiasm for different items. Um, so somehow you have to connect with the people, with our people, understanding and I mean. As Board of Selectmen, the most difficult thing that we do, in my opinion, is hire people. I, I think that um, because of, you, you know, I, I guess, you know, when I had, I got my first job with mobile, um, when, when the guy, when Red Gunther said, well, Tom, where do you want to eat? Where would you like to go to lunch? And I said, geez, I never had this thing called barbecue. I'd love to have a good barbecue place. And he says, you're a New Englander. I said, yeah. He said, you never had barbecue? I said, no. He, then next thing you know, he uh, goes around the office and collects 10, 15 guys. And next thing I know, everybody's taking their suit coat and ties off. And, and, and we're off going to over to Red Byron's barbecue place and on Harry Hines Boulevard in Dallas. and. And we sit there, and and that was probably the greatest thing I learned about hiring somebody is because they they got a feel for me. Guess what? We can't go to BTS and take Kevin down to BTS and take out our suit coats. They we don't we don't hire. They, we're not allowed to hire people that way. So so I, I'd like to find a person that has had a. a a history of working with with residents um, to listen to what what they have to say, um, and then and is able to challenge or or funnel that enthusiasm for a particular item or or, or goal, um, along with sound fiscal management, um, and I guess someone that. Um, and understanding that you know, some of them probably going to have someone for three to five years. But that three to five years, that person has a great work ethic. He's not. He's willing to put in, you know, put in what it takes to make the job, or what the job happens. And somebody say, well, what does that mean? I said, I don't know. What it, I don't know if I can describe it, but I know when I see it, okay. that person. So, I, I that's that's what I'm looking for. Uh, for me, there's always a tension between uh, policy and practice, right? So there's a practical side of, of local government, and then there's a the policy side. Everything from this to this is just policies that have been developed over the last 20 years. How do you do a poll hearing? How do you do a liquor license? How do you do a public hearing? When do you start opening the warrant, the calendar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And then there's the practice of the phone ringing every day. And so there's, there's an inherent tension between being uh, policy driven and then the practical element of, of uh, a local day-to-day -day governance, which is essentially what town administrator uh, does. Interaction with staff is really important. Uh, I would also look for uh, a fresh set of eyes to review some of our things inside these policies. They get updated, they get amended. We kind of live and die by them. Uh, as well as uh, review our, our annual calendar. I said this to the last two as well. We have a calendar that's loosely based on the Beatles, uh, you know, a, a year in the life. And so we have a year in the life. And so how, how, do we, how do we not miss a Schedule A submission? How do we, you know, when do the books actually have to close? When do the auditors get called? And why do we bring the auditors in at this time every year? Because blah, 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 blah. So that's kind of what, what uh, I would look for. Style is, is going to be evident and it's going to be early. And that's why you have contracts, right? That's just the way it is. Sure. Uh, but those are the kind of things that I would look for. So I hope that was helpful. It was. Thank you. Anything else? No, I think uh, I think that answered my question. So it was simple what my expectations would be. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So we got about a, almost a nine million dollar budget. We've got almost four thousand residents. We've got proximity. We coordinate and collaborate with other towns. We participate in the regional council of governments. 
we do what we can. We think what we do well is done well, and we're always looking to improve. A lot of grants, too. Yeah. So. Mm. I agree. Right? Yeah. Okay. Right, well, if you thanks. get nothing else for us, we're going to be on time. Well, I'd like to keep that yeah. that way. How are we going to end with the memory? <laughs> time management is important. Good first impression. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> All right, Kevin. Thanks so much for taking the Thank time you. and meeting with us. Thanks. Nice so, to meet you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Our next steps are uh, interviews tomorrow, okay. uh, deliberation over the next week to 10 days, and then uh, phone calls thereafter. All right? All right. Thank you all. Thanks so much. much. Nice talking with you. Okay. I had to put this with the right space. This has to go. All set, Mr. Chair? I am. Is there a motion to, is there any more discussion? Is there any thanking of FCAT tonight? Thank you, FCAT. If there's no more discussion, is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, motion. We have a motion and a second. Kevin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Three to zero. If you can call us out at 850.